Welcome to Counterpoint for Thursday, May 14th. This is the program that brings together a couple of people you well know. Bill Hall, the editorial page editor for the Lewis and Morning Tribune, who generally represents the liberal point of view. And on the conservative side, Doug Wilson, a Moscow minister and columnist for the Idahonian Daily News. And I'm Glenn Johnson. In just a moment, you'll hear a column from these two gentlemen and their responses. And later on in the program, we'll get to the grab bag of current topics. But first of all, here's Bill Hall. Spies tell me that my children have been worried about their father. I will turn 50 later this month, and they fear it may be one of those bad birthdays that depress a person. They want to give me a party to chase away the birthday blues. And I will be delighted to attend, of course, but they need not worry on this of all birthdays. Last month, I was one of the involuntary participants in a grinding collision on the open highway. And as I sit here now, relatively unscathed, I'm delighted to be any age. 50 sounds terrific by comparison with the alternative. The reason I sit here relatively unscathed, facing 50 instead of the other side of the great beyond, is because I was wearing my seat belt. That belt saved my bacon. You might imagine, therefore, that I am a big supporter of the laws requiring you to protect yourself by wearing your seat belt. Not so. I have some personal freedom reservations about Big Brother's tendency to save us from ourselves. And so I support your assertion, if you make it, that it should be up to you whether you want to take the risk of riding in a car without a belt. I will mention that such an assertion is akin to insisting that you have the right to stick your wet tongue into an electric light socket. I will mention that if you drive without a belt that you are a bit of an idiot. But it's a free country overrun with idiots intent on harming themselves in one fashion or another, and I prefer that sort of country to the other kind. I'm sure my colleague, Doug Wilson, feels the same. I'm sure he will join me in asserting the right of adults to decide for themselves whether they will wear their seat belts or their motorcycle helmets. And I'm sure he will join me in asserting the right of adults without any interference from Big Budinsky to decide whether to purchase cocaine or a video of Deep Throat. If the issue is whether we have the right to harm ourselves, then it applies equally to movies, drugs, seat belts, and light sockets. The liberals who want to require belts and the conservatives who want to outlaw drugs and sex movies are autocratic cousins. Nonetheless, I am glad I was wearing my belt. I'm glad to be pushing 50 to the limit, and after that experience, I'm more glad than I ever imagined I would be to sit here and gaze upon the conservative kisser of a nice old nut like you, Doug Wilson. Uh, gee, thanks, Bill. The, uh, you almost disappointed me there. I, I was right with you when you were talking about seat belts, and I was right with you when you were talking about motorcycle helmets, but then you started talking about pornography, and you started talking about uh, cocaine use, drug abuse. The, the difference between those two types of activities, which you attempted to put in the same bag, is this. The person who doesn't use a motorcycle helmet, or the person who doesn't buckle up, is affecting only himself. The society which tolerates the open degradation of women, uh, which you find in pornography, is, is a society which is degrading itself. It's not just the participants involved, it's the person who walks by. And the issue is not whether individuals should be able to lust in a way that only affects themselves, of course, of course that's, that's not none of the state's business. The issue is what's publicly available, what the society in, in, in general tolerates. Well, I would expect someone uh, who uh, uh, doesn't support the ERA to hide behind a woman's skirts, but never behind a naked lady. This does surprise me. Uh, your original statement... Uh, excuse, me, excuse, excuse me, I, 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 I don't follow that. It's ju it's just Could you a, put that in the syllogism? Uh, it's, it's just a joke with, with, with no uh, intent other than to distract you from this next stunning point. <laughs> this next stunning point uh, is that your original statement uh, that there is harm uh, to others with pornography and there is none with a traffic accident uh, is not true. I agree with your, your essential point that, the, that on a traffic accident or motorcycle helmet, the harm is sort of one or two steps removed and the same is true uh, with pornography. Um, the, the cost to society of uh, the little experience I had the other day is considerable. The cost in, in uh, the policeman's time, the cost in uh, what it does to all our insurance rates, uh, the cost if someone had been uh, hurt uh, seriously lifelong of, of taking care of them. Uh, not wearing your, your seat belt makes you more likely uh, to become uh, a drag on society. Well, but, but part of the problem is that y is you, you keep trying to solve problems that are created by the liberal uh, tendency to get involved in all facets of society. The reason someone... No, I want to get out of all facets of society. But no, well, why I don't want to tell you you have to wear your seatbelt. Well, uh, but, uh, but the matter of fact is that uh, if you wear your seatbelt, you're less likely to cost me money in the long run. But, but why, are, uh, why is the victim of a traffic accident going to cost society? 
It's because we have assumed responsibilities in the area of welfare. The, it's because it costs less money to be thrown against your seatbelt than against your windshield. Yeah, it costs less money to whom? To uh, you as an insurance payer. To, the, to, to, uh, if, if you get so banged up in an accident that you can't support yourself, if you get so banged up that you take thousands of dollars of care uh, and you can't afford to pay that yourself, somebody's got to pay it. No, the people me. who pay the insur uh, insurance. Uh, excuse it. me. The, the people, the, the insurance companies are set up in this way. The you people, can end up on welfare. The, peop the people who drive poorly, the people who have a poor track record, they are the ones who pay higher rates. People who are demonstrably safe drivers don't suffer the consequences. That's not true. That's not the way insurance it wor uh, works. Uh, uh, overall rates are based on overall cost of insurance companies. So there's no difference whether you're... I wouldn't expect a right winger like you to understand the business <laughs> world as well as a liberal like me, but uh, that's the it, fact. So you're saying it's a fact that, it, that uh, if I go into an insurance company and I have, haven't had an accident for 40 years, they're going to give me the same ra rate that someone... Uh, is going to get who gets their license suspended three times. No, they're not. They're not suspended three times. No, but the, they're not. But well, your, my, your, your insurance point. rates, your, your point is wrong. Your, your insurance rates can be raised even though you have never had an accident in your life if that insurance company is starting to lose money. They will raise everybody's rates generally as well as raising the rates uh, even higher for those who've had an accident. Or if you should have a mistake and have a teenager, then your rates will go up even more even though you've had no accidents whatsoever. Most teenagers are caused by mistakes. Well, it might be a mistake if we continue this too much longer, so let's go now to Doug Wilson, and Doug, here's your comment. One of the most enduring myths in modern political discourse is the myth that liberal policies actually help the poor. For years, conservatives accepted the myth, but argued that welfare was none of the government's business. Consequently, the error was reinforced by both sides of the welfare debate. But in recent years, some hard, cold facts have tumbled the myth. Welfare continues, but it is rarely described in the utopian fashion it once was. No more wars on poverty. Fact, welfare destroys the very people it was intended to help. It creates dependency upon entitlements, and far from being an escape from poverty, it is a poverty trap. Fact, the thing that the bureaucrats in Washington want to do, the last thing they want to do, rather, is to eliminate poverty. If they did, what would happen to their jobs? Fact, what slavery couldn't do, what discrimination couldn't do, welfare has done, destroy the black family. No one disputes the fact that the black family is in a horrible way, but at last, the blame for this is being placed where it belongs, on the welfare policies of the federal government. The issue is not food, medicine, or shelter. The issue is slavery. We now have in place a monstrous system of disincentives. We pay men not to work. We pay pregnant teenagers not to marry. In short, we pay people to be irresponsible. It is here that we see a true callousness toward the poor. Instead of admitting their mistake, liberals want to stick with the status quo. It is their ticket to political power. And so it continues. Nothing really changes. The poor are urged to shuffle on down to the plantation and collect their food stamps. Bill? Well, welfare uh, beats the hell out of, out of the alternative, which is starvation. But I would agree that uh, uh, all movements go too far, and the good-hearted movement to provide for people who truly cannot provide for themselves in this country has gone much too far. And I don't believe it's good for a person uh, to sit home and do nothing all day, whether that be someone on welfare officially or a rich doctor's wife. So what, what do you want? Do you, do you want a little bit of welfare, not a lot of welfare? I, w I want uh, more attention to who is truly able to go out and work for their welfare. I no, like these workfare pro attention programs. Attention by whom? I, I mean, who's in charge of who works? Well, who we, the, we have this imperfect system of electing people who appoint people. You would call them, uh, in a pejorative sense, bureaucrats, I believe. Right. Now, I'm, surely you're not going to say uh, that all bureaucrats are bad people. Uh, there are so, some of those are pretty competent, too. Now, what I'm, what I'm saying is the state is not our mother, and that if the state... Oh, yes, the state is sometimes our mother. If sometimes the state is too much our mother, too much our big brother at times, but, but wanting yeah, a little the, bit of... The state is us, banded together to help each other, and if that's mother, so be it. No, that's, that's not what the Constitution says the federal government ought to do. The, the point that I'm making The Constitution is, is silent on that subject, but your heart should not be... No, the, the, Good grief. The, the Constitution is not silent at all on the subject. The Constitution says that if powers are not expressly delegated to the federal government, then it, it goes to the people or to the individual states. And welfare is not expressly delegated to the federal government. So you, you just admit you're wrong on that one. The point I want to make about welfare is that having a little bit of welfare is like uh, wanting a woman to be a little bit pregnant. 
You just can't have it. Well, you're, you're worried about what I call the fat man precedent, that a 300-pound man won't uh, uh, take five pounds off on the grounds that it's a uh, precedent for starving to death. You can help someone genuinely needs uh, a, a, a person, uh, a quadriplegic. We can help one of them, can't we, without helping an able-bodied no, man? No, look, look your, your analogy is... If we start helping uh, people who really uh, need it, we'll end up helping uh, people who don't need it. And I say, uh, if that's the way it works, if that must be, let's err on the side of helping too many. But, we, but I agree with you, we are going to hurt the able-bodied person. Your analogy is a faulty one. It's not a 300-pound man <coughs> losing five pounds. It's a 300-pound man gaining 15 pounds a week, and when asked to only gain 10 pounds a week, he thinks he's on a diet. Well, he's and not he screams, the only fat head in this discussion. And he, and he screams bloody murder. Uh, entitlements, uh, expenditures on entitlements and welfare. Well, what do we do? We close what, down welfare no, altogether? Let me, let me finish the point. The expenditures under Reagan have increased. Reagan has only succeeded in slowing down the rate of increase. And everybody in Washington, uh, liberals are holler, hollering bloody murder. He's not, he's not cutting the, uh, the fat at all. He's just slowing the, the, the growth of the increase of fat. Now, the, the problem is this. We don't need to just cut back on welfare and make it more efficient. We need to eliminate it altogether. And so replace that, it with what? Just so your good-natured reaching no, into your warm-hearted no, little the, pocket. The, the welfare agency, the welfare is necessary, but the agencies that take care of welfare should be, number one, the family, and number two, churches, private charitable organizations, period. It's not the government. Well, what, let's say, what if I had uh, been paralyzed in that accident we were talking about, and my family are a bunch of louts, and they won't look after me? Then you would have to, if your family won't look after you, then, and the immediate family, then you go to the general family. If uh, failing that, you would go to private charitable organizations. I can't go anywhere. I'm uh, paralyzed. I'm just lying there in my apartment, forgotten by you and everybody else in society, until we put together the community. The community's got its heart together and started looking after okay. poor slobs like me. Uh, no. You, you, this voluntarism doesn't work and uh, never worked in this country. Uh, sure it did. left a lot of people, uh, uh, there, there are fewer people left this destitute and dying in Garrett somewhere in this Look, country now than, orphanages, than ever before. Orphanages and hospitals are, are the uh, principal expression of, of the desire to help people who are who are hurting, well, that's and, they are not, and they are not an outgrowth of the welfare state. The welfare state is a parasitic thing that has come after the fact and trying to muscle in on the action. You sit there able-bodied and lucky, along with me, and it's so easy for us to talk. If you'd been born even dumber than you are and, and, and not as healthy, and uh, you couldn't make your way in the world, it, you know, it's really easy to sit and look down on, on some mother of, of eight uh, with a 90 IQ in Chicago no, whose bum husband is you, left you, you missed the point that I made earlier. The issue is not whether we take care of people. The point I was making earlier, when the government under wait, wait, when the government undertakes to do something, the government makes the problem worse. Are you really concerned about the quadriplegics? Are you really the concerned? The government tends to overdo, and well, your well, system underdoes. Well, I would rather overdo, but I don't have to take either no, but, extreme. Well, but when you overdo it, you make the problem worse. It's time now to go to the grab bag of current topics, and at the top of the bag is Gary Hart. The presidential hopeful invited reporters to follow him around. The rest became history. He withdrew from the campaign. And there are a couple of issues that deal with this. Bill, we'll start it out. Was the press sensationalizing that story, or do the American people really have the right to know his private life? Well, they have the right to know whether uh, a candidate is flawed, and, and I don't especially care uh, uh, if a president uh, fools around a little bit, if his missus doesn't treat him right. We wouldn't want a crotchety president, would we? Yeah, but the issue is whether this was symptomatic of him. Uh, and what was symptomatic of Gary Hart was his stupidity. Uh, deep down, he's a pretty shallow candidate. And uh, uh, for a man to say to the press, uh, uh, my life's an open book, follow me anywhere, uh, uh, spy on me, and then bring a 29-year-old woman into his house over the weekend with his wife gone is, is not one of your brightest presidential candidates. I'd want to go a step further than that. I, well, I agree with you that it wasn't the smartest move in the world. I, I believe that whether a man is faithful to his wife is a genuine matter of concern, not because you're invading someone's private life, because marriage is not a private act. Marriage is a public act. It is something you do in society. Uh, it is something that's registered at the county courthouse. It's not a private act. A man who is willing to betray his wife is a man who is willing to betray, is capable, I should say, of betraying anyone or anything. Uh, if a man is not to be trusted to be faithful to his wife, I wouldn't trust him with my dry cleaning, much less my 
my soul, well, I was being my soul or, or my country. I was being a little bit facetious uh, uh, a while ago, but I believe there are certain things. Even, these are not saints. Uh, there is, has never been a saint run for president. Uh, but you I do believe your wife is not. I do. I do believe there are certain things uh, that a person gives up when he runs for that office. One is having uh, more than a drink or two with all those buttons around, uh, and I think he, he does have to uh, uh, live a, an upright uh, life. Uh, but it's so easy for you and me with our happy marriages to get sanctimonious about how less lucky individuals should live their lives. Look, it's, it's, not, a matter of, it's not a matter of luck at all. It's a matter of commitment. It's a matter well, of... in my case, it was bra just brains and good selection. That, but uh, it's so easy for lucky people to talk. It's just like the welfare thing. You sat here smugly on your, your rich white man's throne talking down to, to black mothers on relief in the middle of Chicago. You should be ashamed of yourself, Doug Wilson. No, look, you, one minute we're talking about Gary Hart, and then, and then we're talking a, about welfare in Chicago. It's the same thing. It's, it's looking down Doug I, Wilson's nose I at people I, who, don't, uh, who didn't get as, as lucky to have a happy life and I they don't have to I go do, shopping. I think I do all right in the debate, but I don't dance very well. So you're going to have to uh, stay on one subject at a time. The, you do a lot of dancing in debate, but go ahead. The, uh, the point uh, that I wanted to make is that a man's faithfulness to a basic fundamental covenant in society, which is what marriage is, is a good indication of uh, how he's going to perform in, in discharging his other uh, obligations. Now, I agree with that, but I still say count your lucky stars. I, I'm not an advocate of, of porno journal journalism. I don't believe in invading the privacy of uh, the, uh, the particular candidate or whoever it is. But that's not what the reporters for the Miami Herald did. They were out on the public street, they were observing publicly, and they were behaving themselves. If he had not invited them, in effect, to be there, I would say what they did was reprehensible, but he was really asking for it. And then I understand the Washington Post even had even a, a more documented story ready to go with the Washington Post. But I think what Doug and I are talking about is um, more or less hiding out in the bushes yeah. and peeping through the windows. Uh, right. uh, that's, uh, I do think even with presidential candidates, that's going a bit far, except he said, spy on me. And so they did. And the rest is history, so to speak. Well, Doug, we'll start with you on this one. This is immunity in the Iran affair. Were investigators too hasty in granting immunity to several figures in the Iran-Contra affair? Will anyone ever go to jail over the whole mess? They were not too hasty. They were not hasty enough. Congress is trying to play this for all the political, um, um, for all the political points they can get from it. If they really want to know what happened, if that's the objective, so we can find out what happened, correct the problem, you know, whatever the problem was, and get back on track and have a unified front that we can uh, display to the world in our foreign policy. If that's the objective, then they should grant immunity to everyone concerned, get the story out now. But if you do that, you can't play it for all it's worth day in, day out in the news and use it to drag down the president. Well, it's a bit of a charade, but it's uh, a useful charade. Any congressional hearing uh, is based largely on what uh, uh, the members of Congress and, and their staff aides have already learned. Uh, but uh, that doesn't mean there isn't some uh, point in exposing uh, to the public what you have learned, showing why you are going to move on ahead with this legislation, or in this case, why Congress is, is upset uh, that uh, its legislation was ignored, that its will was ignored by the executive branch. Laying out what you have learned in front of the American people uh, has I, its point. I, and yes, there is some politicking and some, and some, uh, uh, of course there is. And some grandstanding involved. Uh, you know, there, there's grandstanding and showboating. But only by liberals. Huh? In this particular case, the, I assume that you were referring to the Boland Amendment, which is quite possibly unconstitutional to, be, uh, to begin with. There's a whole separate can of worms. Mm, I was just uh, saying there. you can't spend uh, money, you can't uh, spend the taxpayer's money uh, without uh, it's being appropriated by Congress. But, the, but there is a, but that's all up for grabs. Was it in fact the taxpayer's money? Was it privately donated money? Uh, it is very clear. Looking they at sold the taxpayer's weapons uh, to Iran, which gave them money, uh, which was the taxpayer's money, which they passed on uh, to the Congress. It, that, that is all by no means clear. And what I am saying is, I think no, I think that is that what I just said is clear. That what's not, not clear is whether it was three million or ten million. No, what, what's not clear is whether um, government money went to the Congress. That's not clear. Money from the sale of government taxpayer-owned weapons went to the Congress. Let's, uh, let's get back to the, the central point. I don't blame the, you for wanting to get back to the central point. We're not doing well, too well with this one. <laughs> Wait, well, you, you know, I don't want to get in, into it. Did to, did not, does so. Did, you know, it, it is not the case that we, we don't know whether it was private money or government money that went to the Congress. I do. All right. 
Now, the, the thing that I want it was to both. Say, the thing that I want to say is that when you have a, uh, an operation like this that is uncovered, you can have you can take it in two directions. You can either say, let's find out what happened and fix it right now, or and, and in which case you're thinking of the interests of the country, or you can think in the interests of the Democratic Party, which is to squeeze it for all that you, you can you can get. And the thing that strikes well, let's not get wait, the Democratic Party on this. The thing uh, that strikes me about this is that in this in these hearings, uh, General Secord came off looking pretty good, and the congressman came off looking pretty shabby, like they were trying to uh, get something out of it that wasn't there. General Secord came off looking like a loose cannon. He does he doesn't uh, uh, he still doesn't understand to this day what he did wrong. A far different uh, Bud McFarland. Th there is a, uh, a sadder but wiser man who knows he did wrong, admitted it, and you, is regretful. I've, I've General Secord, please, might makes right. General Secord's only regret is the same as yours, that we aren't running every country in the world clandestinely. I, I've got a, a question to ask you. Do you think when Oliver North winds up testifying, as he, no doubt he will at some point in front of this, do you think that the American people looking at that are going to come away thinking, my, what a fine pack of congressmen we have? Or are they going to walk away thinking Ollie North's a hero? What do you think? N uh, not what do you think personally, but what do you think the American people are going to think? Well, I, I, uh, I don't know what they. I think, as usual, these hearings they will, they will like what they see of some congressmen and not like what they see of others. It's my guess that uh, Ollie North won't come across too well on this. He's even more of a loose cannon than Secord. Uh, my my prediction is the reverse. Uh, just whether whether or not I support everything that North has done is, is besides no, see, the I, can, uh, I, I understand that Secord and, and undoubtedly North, but uh, it comes across to me that Secord really believed he was uh, uh, doing this for right. his country and a few bucks besides. Uh, but I think it was the country that motivated him more than the bucks. Uh, Same but, with North. But that you know that's uh, that's uh, no no excuse. That's you know that somebody goes out and gets drunk and runs over a child. He didn't mean to do it. Uh, but Secor doesn't understand that, that you, you can't just sp spend American taxpayers' money here and there without uh, asking Congress if, uh, first if you can do it. It was a deliberate attempt by these clowns on behalf of the president, without the president's knowledge, I believe, to go around it, uh, it, Congress. It was and that is unconstitutional. It was, you a constitution it was perfect. a deliberate attempt to violate the spirit of the Boland Amendment, but it's very clear in McFarland's testimony that there Boland was a very... Amendment, hell, we're talking about Congress must appropriate the money that we, uh, that we spend in this country. We, you, uh, a president cannot just tax the people and spend money without the permission of Congress. There has to be a specific appropriation for so Saudi Arabia expense. can't give money? Saudi Arabia can, but we're not talking about... I'm talking about the sale of these weapons, American-owned weapons, that means American money. Don't, don't you agree that the taxpayers should have the use of that money, even if it goes to the country? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Treatment of former Idaho Congressman George Hansen. He is back in the news again. Has he been given a fair shake by the Justice Department, is the question we have. Uh, yes, I think he, he's been treated like any other prisoner in, in, the, in the same circumstances. The, probably the, the question is whether that law should have been passed uh, requiring congressmen to uh, be honest with us about where they, they get their money. Uh, that's that's the, the one place where some members of Congress, including Democrats, uh, agree he, he has been abused. But if, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, doing your time in jail, uh, what makes him so special that, he, can, uh, that he, he doesn't have to abide by the rules of parole? He went to prison, and uh, he was told to uh, uh, stay within a given area, that's normal. They want to look after these people until they're sure that they can behave themselves. It's a rehabilitative uh, process, and he thinks he's special and he doesn't have to go along with that. Well, uh, and so they uh, haul him back into jail. He violated let, his parole. Let's grant that the authorities are, are playing right into Mr. Hansen's hands. Yes, I do. They, they, are, they are making a big production out of it, which is exactly what... I don't agree they're making a big production out of it. I, I agree that in uh, uh, bending over backwards to... Uh, uh, treat him as tough as they treat any other prisoner. Uh, they're giving uh, George Hansen uh, straight lines uh, to play hero. Do you, do you think that uh, Geraldine Ferraro ought to be right there with George Hansen? She no, I think her husband should be. All right. Okay. Doug, espionage. What should be done with those convicted of spying against the United States? Is the death penalty too severe? Is the death penalty too severe? No, First, ab absolutely not. I, I would say in, in, in a time of war, in a, in a, where there's a um, very clear crisis. If someone is guilty of selling secrets to the enemy, then no, I don't object to the death penalty at all. And in the, the situations that we have recently had with the Walkers and also with this Marine uh, Embassy scandal, the uh, 
the secrets that were given in the Walker case and possibly in this embassy case were so detrimental to the security of our, our, our country that if these people are convicted, given a fair trial, convicted in a court of law of having done this, I would not object to the death penalty for these Marines. If you can clear the death penalty with your conscience, uh, which I cannot, uh, not being a member of the vengeful flock, uh, then you can, you can justify it for uh, uh, this crime. I mean, I, I will concede that if you are going to have a death penalty, it should apply to some things. This is one of the things it should apply to. Okay, Bill, here's a question on trade sanctions. Japanese wouldn't buy our goods, so we impose sanctions on Japanese products imported into this country. Do trade sanctions really work, or does it only escalate the imbalance into the unnecessary trade war? Well, as a general rule, they, they don't work. Ronald Reagan and I see eye to eye on free trade. I'm, ag I'm against uh, sanctions be, uh, as a general rule because you put them on one country, you put them on Japan, pretty soon Japan's going to stop buying all our Northwest wheat. Uh, we're we're going to get in some trouble that way. But this was a slight exception, uh, uh, and I agree with the president on it. I want it clearly understood. Two of my children work in the computer chip industry. As, uh, you might say that's why I'm biased. I say that's why I understand that this was not uh, fair uh, free trade. This was fair trade. Uh, this was price fixing to raise the price uh, so high it drives the American producers out of the business. And uh, then when they're out of the business and no competition, then the Japanese jack the prices back up above the cost of production, way up above. But the problem with, with that is, is in every protectionist measure, there is always an argument why this case is special. And uh, even Adam Smith, when he was served in, uh, in Parliament, was prevailed upon to, uh, to uh, support some protectionist legislation, even though he knew how foolish it is. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Idaho timber or computer chips and how they affect California. Everybody thinks their, their case is special. If the Japanese want to sell chips below market level, they can only do that for a certain amount of time. They can only do that. Uh, until the last American producer goes out of business. Uh, and then some of those chips were down to the, to the last one. It's in Boise, Idaho. The, 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 pr the problem that I, that I see is that once you do this, you're, you get yourself into a situation where you legitimize their responding in kind. Well, suffice to say, I agree with you on this and one. Uh, because uh, really, you should go after the true villain, and that's, uh, you should in some way penalize or fine uh, the uh, specific Japanese manufacturers who are, who are dumping in this country. Uh, and we're competing unfairly, and you shouldn't just throw some sort of a, a blanket solution over the problem that punishes other innocent Japanese business if, people. If there were private companies that were dumping, dumping at below market cost, let them dump. If a foreign government is subsidizing the, the dumping, then we should deal at that level. But we shouldn't do it through tariffs. Tariffs hurt American consumers. By the way, to be fair about this, uh, there are some subsidizing in this country, too. That's there's right. there's a, lot of R &D, a lot of R&D research. Uh, Thursday, November 12th. This is the program that brings together a couple of people you know in the area. Bill Hall, the editorial page editor and columnist for the Lewiston Morning Tribune, who generally represents the liberal point of view. And on the conservative side, Wilson, a Moscow minister and also a columnist with the Lewiston Morning Tribune. I'm Glenn Johnson. In just a few minutes, we'll talk about some current topics, but first of all, here's a column by Doug Wilson. Within the last few days, Mr. Ginsburg has withdrawn himself from consideration for the post of Supreme Court Justice. Some people have little appetite for being pelted with assorted vegetables and dead cats, and Mr. Ginsburg is apparently among them. Speaking for myself, I think the nomination was ill-advised in the first place, and give it what, given what then ensued, I think Mr. Ginsburg was right to step out. But still, there is some basis for regret. Think of what a spectacle it would have been to see the liberal Democrats denounce him for smoking pot. If Mr. Ginsburg had been willing to have a little fun at the hearings, he could have had a lot of fun at the hearings. I don't know, Senator. Does your drug use affect your public service? He also could have had fun on another front. Yes, Senator, I think I am well qualified for the high court. You want me to abandon my conservative approach to the Constitution. 
The liberal approach to the Constitution requires me to see things in it that aren't there. What better way to achieve that perspective than to smoke a little dope? Bill? Well, I don't know whether that's a question uh, or a cry of anguish. Uh, I'll assume it's a, a question as to what I think of what happened to Mr. Ginsburg. Uh, I, I don't think much of it. Uh, um, this is something he did that was akin to drinking bootleg booze, uh, something I would wager a couple of the older members of the court uh, did uh, back when uh, that was illegal. And uh, to uh, knock him off for something like uh, that is uh, proving once again how hypercritical we're getting about uh, rather irrelevant uh, former personal but, habits. But wasn't it apparent to you that we were gearing up for Bork to anything, any dirt, anything that we could use against Ginsburg because he was really conservative was going to be thrown at him, and it was going to be thrown at him by the left. They did it to Bork, and then they, they were doing it to Ginsburg, and it was a losing battle, so he stepped out. Well, I can only uh, speak for myself and not all the other left-wing wackos, uh, but I was certainly not gearing up for it. I, I was tired of that. It was uh, time to find a, a, a nominee that we could all accept, and Ginsburg looked to be like that to me at first. He was shot right, by the way, not by the left. But no, he wasn't shot down by the right. It dismayed some of his supporters on the right, but you'll notice that, uh, that one of the most uh, vocal opponents of what has happened is Orrin Hatch of uh, Utah, who has sort of yes, led, the, led the opposition to what uh, apparently yeah, happened. And nobody is going to call Orrin Hatch a drogo, uh, but um, it was some of the principal people on the right, Senator Jesse Helms, uh, Idaho's own uh, Senator uh, Jim McClure, were, were publicly horrified uh, uh, at this, and uh, Secretary of Education Bennett played a very large role yeah. in this. People like McClure were not horrified at the use. They were just saying, well, this will make it more difficult, but they weren't withdrawing support from Ginsburg at all. The opposition to Ginsburg was going to come in the uh, Senate from the liberal Democrats. They were the ones who did not want him on the court. That's not, not, that doesn't square with the facts. Uh, uh, the, the record isn't clear what was going to happen with the liberals. Uh, for the most part, the one, ones who commented said he sounded a, l a little better than Bork. He sounded more normal than Bork. It was Jesse Helms who was threatening to filibuster if, if uh, Ginsburg went to the floor. Well, speaking of the floor, it's time, Bill, for your floor with uh, your commentary right now. Hey, I'm only human. I admit that when I hear about some scrambled egg being executed for torturing and killing some sweet child, a piece of me is glad that we are killing him. But I was taught better. I was taught by godly people to be better than that part of me that is glad when even a murderer dies. But sometimes the ancient jungle genes well up within a person, and I feel when some mangled approximation of a human mind is put to death in some grubby little state penitentiary, that something decent has been vindicated, that something soiled has been cleansed. But I know better in my head, if not in my heart. I know such thoughts drag me backward, growling and snorting toward the jungle to surrender to what is probably our natural urge to kill. And the flesh is weak. I have been known to abuse the blessing of the fermented grape. I have lusted in my heart after Lena Horn and even Betty Ford. I have in my weaker moral moments longed for just one chance at the switch on some specific electric chair. However, civilization is based on the practical as well as on the ethical need to shake off shoddy temptation as often as we can and to reach upward and rise above our moral failures each time we stumble and we fail. It is in that same context that I sometimes puzzle over my own inconsistency and in rather blindly conceding to women the legal right to abort the unborn. Snuffing fetuses, life support systems awaiting a personality imprint is as bothersome in its fashion as snuffing fully grown human beings. I don't really believe a fertilized, undivided egg is a person, though it is probably the intellectual equal of some of its defenders, but a seven-month fetus, or certainly a fetus even older, is at least close enough to an actual person to make me want to butt into the act of its egregious termination. And I'm not as cocksure as the feminists or the right-to-lifers as to where I would draw the perfect line between a mere egg and an actual person being born. Yes, an unborn baby is innocent, and an adult axe murderer is uh, as guilty, as criminal, as wrong as an animal born with his morals missing can get. But killing is killing, and we, of all animals, are supposed to be better than that. Or is there good killing and bad killing? Are our jungle genes sometimes right when they become anxious to obliterate some piece of human trash? Doug? You bet there's a, di uh, a difference between good killing and bad killing. That's uh, precisely what the liberal fails to understand in this whole death penalty, uh, anti-abortion debate. We are opposed to the execution of innocent human life without due process. 
and it is no inconsistency to therefore be in favor of granting due process to the guilty, finding them guilty, and then executing them. Guilt, innocence, these are strange words. I assume Jesus was a liberal. Uh, no, not at all. Do you think he was opposed to the death penalty? Yes, that's my impression. Then, uh, I, 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 do you, well, do you I think would, Jesus would pull a switch? This is, this is not the, the time or place to, uh, to discuss that, but I will refer you back to your script, scriptures. It's been a while since you uh, read them, obviously. Uh, Jesus emphatically endorsed the death penalty. So, so much for your uh, uh, gentle uh, Jesus, meek and mild mythology of the, the, of the, the liberal mind. The electric chair. He, uh, he said in, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, that someone who cursed his father or mother was, uh, was worthy of death and ought to be executed. So, uh, I'll just refer you to that. The point is, his modern, his modern followers who assert that justice is the primary concern, not human life. Human life is not an absolute. Human life is to be protected but it is not to be protected because it's, it, it's an absolute. When you say killing is killing, that's like saying, well, sex is sex, so there's no difference between rape and uh, sex between a mar married couple. Well, it's, uh, it's all sexual, isn't it? You're obliterating, uh, obliterating distinctions that ought not to be obliterated. There is a difference between guilt and innocent, innocence. The axe murderer is guilty and ought to be executed, and it doesn't matter to me if he's electrocuted or hung. He ought to be executed, and the unborn child ought to be spared. Well, turn the other cheek unless you really hate the guy's guts. Is that the message? No, you, you don't. This has nothing to do with hatred at all. It has to do with justice. I, I it has nothing to do with hatred. How can you say that? Uh, the only fun in execution is, is, the, is the feeling of having got e even with the SOB. Now, now if that, that kind of hatred and revenge is inadmissible and wrong to have, even when you are dealing with a person who's committed some despicable crime. But justice remains justice. Some people deserve to die. I'll tell you what I really object to about capital punishment. It's uh, what it does to me. Uh, I, you may be a better person than the rest of us, but most of something kind of ugly wells up in you when, the, when it comes judgment day uh, on the uh, chopping block. And uh, that, 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 that bothers me to teach killers the, the wickedness of killing by killing them. Look, I have, I have no doubt that if we had public hangings, there would be all sorts of people that showed up simply because they wanted to see the show, and the furthest thing from their hearts and minds would be a concern for justice. I, I'll, I'll Don't grant, you think that's the majority of the people? I would say, and that's wrong, I'm, and I'm willing to grant that. But that doesn't mean that these people don't deserve to die. Adolf Hitler deserved to die. Pol Pot deserved to die. Uh, a person who murders uh, some uh, three-year-old child deserves to die. And the state has a responsibility to grant this person a fair trial, give them due process, make sure there's no mistake, and if it's confirmed that they, in fact, are guilty, they must be executed. It's time now to go to the grab bag of current topics. Throw out some questions here to our two gentlemen in the studio. Doug, we'll start with you. The rape shield law now says that a woman does not have to reveal her past unless it proves relevant to the case. This invites the defense to search the past that's recently occurred here in Whitman County. Should a woman have to reveal her sexual past for something that was done to her now? Is the shield law really protecting her rights? Well, a woman should have to re reveal her past if it is pertinent to the present case. You can't just indiscriminately dig up a lot of uh, dirt on somebody and, and expect that to fly. But if a woman, for example, has a history of false accusations of rape, then that is obviously pertinent in a rape case. And the defense has every right to search uh, her past for evidence of that nature. It should not be admitted if it is irrelevant, but if it is relevant, and some situations could easily be relevant, it should be, it must be admitted. You can't assume the rapist is guilty until proven innocent. You can't assume the victim is a victim until that's been established in a court of law. Once it's been established, then the victim should be treated with great consideration and the criminal punished. But you can't assume that beforehand. Well, what, what is rape? Uh, rape is forced sex. And so if a, a woman has sex 47 times in one day with the same man, and the 48th time she says no, and he proceeds, uh, that is rape. So I agree to some extent with what Doug says about if she has a history of uh, uh, of phony accusations of rape, a well-proven history, that would be a different matter. Uh, but just uh, that she is uh, a little loose in her social habits uh, is irrelevant to the question of whether it is rape. Okay, well, let's put it this way. What the feminists want to do is say in any accusation of rape, the, the innocent until proven guilty rule does not apply. The victim is accorded 
bona fide established victim status when that has not been established now i certainly think that true victims of rape ought to be constrict treated with great consideration and great sympathy because of the horrible thing that they've gone through but you cannot say that a woman's past is irrelevant people do make uh, false accusations well she has a history of false accusations fine but uh, but uh, these attorneys are for the most part bringing in the fact that she was just a loose woman who was really asking for it and I don't care if she was I say she's asking for it 47 times and the 48th time she said no no means no legally even if she's married to the dude okay Bill this is your question now that Casper Weinberger has resigned from the defense secretary position National Security Advisor Frank Carlucci will be replacing him. Do you think Carlucci will be able to follow Weinberger's uh, past record? Well, for the sake of defense and for the sake of the budget, uh, let's hope not. Uh, uh, Weinberger was his own worst enemy. He uh, alienated members of Congress. He went in and demanded this and demanded that, and uh, he would ask for unreasonable amounts and not compromise the way everyone else did in every other department. Department of Government. In other, words, in, in other words, he didn't play the game, and he got a lot for not playing the game. No, he played the greedy game. I mean, he expected the whole budget to be turned over to him and to hell with the schools and everything else. Carlucci is a, a smoother person. He's, he's likely to be more realistic. He's, he's less paranoid about how much defense he's is. He's a bureaucrat, needed. and there's nothing that uh, should chill our blood to to have someone praise some Washington bureaucrat as realistic. You know what realistic how means? How can you say? That means, that means he knows the rules. He's willing to go along to get along. And that's the kind of trouble, that's the kind of behavior that's got us into this big mess. There are good bureaucrats and bad bureaucrats, granted, but uh, to uh, say that Carlucci is a bureaucrat and that Weinberger is not, my God, he hasn't had his snout out of the public trough in 25 years. Casper <laughs> <laughs> Weinberger is not a professional Washington politico. Uh, Frank Carlucci He's is. been in, what, four cabinet jobs already? It, 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 he, he, Carlucci's in his first. Look, if someone is an outsider and comes inside and begins to play the game, then you, it is legitimate to say, well, they're playing the Washington game. If someone comes from outside and, and comes inside and gets inside but doesn't compromise like Weinberger did not, I prefer to think of him as an Government outsider. Government employees you agree with aren't bureaucrats. Government employees who uh, have no perspective of the nation outside the beltway are bureaucrats. People who go come in from outside and don't forget their roots are people that, no matter how long they stay there, are uh, my kind of people. I, I like to have them there, and I'm sorry to see Casper uh, Weinberger go. Well, it's time to move our snout into someone else's trough, so to speak. Looking at the recent stock market plunge dug just a few weeks ago and comparing it with the market crash of 1929 that caused the Great Depression, do you think the stock market dive on Monday, October 19th, will cause another recession? I think the stock market um, crash that we had a few weeks ago on Monday is going to be a date that goes down in history. Uh, many people don't realize that the stock market crash of 29 did not result in a depression overnight. It was a stock market crash and then within a couple of years, couple three years, the depression set in in earnest. I think we're headed at the very least for a recession within the next few years and I think it is most likely going to be a depression and I think a lot of people are going to realize too late that you can't spend yourself rich. Well, the question, uh, you're right, is whether there's going to be, uh, isn't whether there's going to be a recession. There is always going to be a recession. There is inevitably another recession. It's just the ups and downs of our, our economy. Uh, the question is whether there's going to be a, a depression. Uh, and it's my, uh, my guess that it, it, there is not going to be one. We have far more safeguards in place now. Uh, we have far more of a willingness uh, than we had in 1929. Uh, by, yeah. go by government to intervene and manage the and, situation. And the, typical, and the typical government solutions are, are these. We've got safeguards, all right, but we've got paper safeguards, safeguards that are little decals in the windows of banks, you know, FDIC insured. The FDIC does great when a bank here or a bank there defaults. But if Argentina defaults, if Brazil defaults, if a whole bunch of banks go, the FDIC has about, in its reserves, has about 1% of all the total deposits. They can't cover it. The only way they could cover it is if the Federal Reserve printed up a bunch of new funny money, paid off all the debts, and then we were into hyperinflation. We are sitting at the very top of a house of cards. This whole thing is going to collapse. There's nothing the FDIC can do about it. There's nothing the Federal Reserve can do about it. And there's nothing any president, uh, liberal, conservative, Republican, or Democrat can do about it. Within our lifetimes, we are going to see the whole thing come down again. Well, uh, I think uh, you can do something about it. Uh, 
Uh, it's a, the market, uh, the economy is largely a confidence game, and there's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy. If everybody believes there's going to be a depression, there probably will be one. But if, if uh, the president and Congress and the, a lot of other world leaders really take hold and start moving and doing something and not just talking, and it's not, no, by no means clear that's what's going to happen. But if they do, I think that will turn the uh, confidence well, around I, and we will come I'll out I'll grant of you, it. hypothetically, they could do something, but they would have to start by abolishing the Department of uh, uh, health and Human Services, they'd have to start by abolishing the Department of Education. They'd have to start by uh, cutting abolishing out... the Department of the, Defense. Well, it, it, yeah, the one thing that the Constitution tells the federal government to do that it's doing. It, uh, the, the Constitution tells uh, portions to the federal government the responsibility for our defense. That is their legitimate role. Their legitimate role is not in education. It is not in welfare. It is not in Social Security. All that stuff has got to go. And as long as, uh, as liberals uh, continue to say, well, we'll let anything go except these things, the, the, the crashes well, inevitable. What I worry about is uh, a repeat of what happened in 1929 in another way, and that's... Raising that taxes? Uh, oh. that, no, that Ronald Reagan uh, may still be uh, very much like Herbert Hoover. He it, might raise taxes, in it other is words, a, just like, it, just like it, well, Herbert Hoover I'll get to that in a minute. In a false, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a bum rap on Herbert Hoover to say he caused the Depression. Many things uh, came to pass that caused the Depression. It is not a bum rap to say that he just sat there and said, dear me, and, and didn't really know what to do about it. That he, it was against his religion, uh, his political religion, uh, to uh, have the government intervene in the economy. And he sat there and did nothing and oh, let okay. the whole thing go no, to pot. No, wait, wait a second. Uh, first, when FDR came in, he did nothing but implement all the things that Herbert Hoover wanted to implement but didn't have the congressional f support for. That's baloney. That's, that's, Franklin that's Roosevelt. the first point. The second thing is Herbert Hoover didn't sit there and do nothing. He raised taxes, just like the liberal Democrats want to do. Franklin do you want to do that? Do you want to raise taxes? I, I want to, yes, I want to raise taxes, and I want to, uh, to cut uh, the, the bejesus out of everything in government. Uh, out of everything? Out of, or just defense? I want, I want to, uh, I'll, I'll go along with... Um, you're going to start writing editorials for your paper saying let's cut uh, welfare uh, spending? Let's yes. And by how much? And education. I just, Social I'm not, Security? I, I, how much? Uh, 2,347 2, 2, cents. I know. Let's talk I, percentage. Um, let's, talk, let's talk real money. Well, I don't know percentage. I am in favor of sitting down and going through that budget with a fine tooth comb and saying these are hard times. We're going to end up worse if we don't cut education. Anybody we, who goes through the budget with a fine tooth, tooth comb is going to be be there till kingdom come. You need to go through that budget with a meat axe. Okay, go through the budget with a meat axe, but, uh, but it's got to be defense as, as, as this is the consensus. We're going to have to come to it. We're going to say the situation. Okay. We're gonna, uh, the, the liberals are going to have to give up uh, some of the budget for education and social programs, and the conservatives are going to have to uh, give up with some of their love of war. Oh, and uh, we're gonna, and the conservatives are going love to have of, to love uh, of war. Uh, well, their their war department. Uh, they're going to have to tilt. Uh, and the conservatives are going to have to go along, as I think most of them will, except maybe Ronald Reagan, with uh, uh, a tax uh, increase. Uh, we've got to do something about that deficit that is dragging us down. And it's going to take uh, my sacrifice of, of my personal political beliefs and your sacrifice of yours. Uh, well, well the, there's the one bright side in all this is that over the last few years we have come to hear liberals talking about budget deficits as though they were a bad thing. Well, I don't that's know some, what that's liberals some, say. Oh, that's no, some no, consolation. Bill, here's the next question. With the rapid spread of AIDS and the panic it's caused throughout America, universities are now putting condoms in vending machines next to candy bars and soda pop. University officials feel this will decrease the spread of AIDS on their campus. <laughs> will condoms that are readily available in vending machines prevent AIDS or promote more sexual promiscuity? Uh, I think uh, they will provide some slight help with, uh, in the protection of AIDS. They're certainly fallible, and any help uh, is better than none at all. As for promoting promiscuity, I, I am amazed to hear grown men and women with their own glands still intact suggesting that college students are motivated to want to fool around with each other by the presence of condoms on campus. Uh, they, uh, uh, people are... Uh, uh, college students uh, are just did little heaving seas of hormones. Wait, uh, that's where, what where does it, not some... Uh, where were all these hormones 60 years ago? That's what I say. <laughs> no, wait a second. You, if you, you can't say that it's, it's genetic or biological. There were generations where people behaved with decency and propriety. Nonsense. This is not one of them. Are, are, well, are you saying that there's no difference between this generation? I'm saying there were generations. Are you saying there was no difference? The sexual revolution accomplished nothing? I'm saying there were generations of large numbers of illegitimate children. No, no wait, wait, a, wait a second. There, there was illegitimacy, but are you saying that the sexual revolution was not, in fact, a revolution in sexual mores? I'm saying it was and should have been. 
Uh, it was a revolution in mores. That meant that before that time, all those people the with the same biological hormones were behaving themselves to a greater extent, not completely, but to a greater extent yes, than this current generation is uh, behaving itself. Yes, correct? I agree. But you, have, uh, uh, you haven't heard the revolution is over. It has been won. Uh, on behalf of human, human sexuality, and you can't increase the yeah, amount all, of... Yeah, but see, it, uh, it has been won on behalf of human sexuality, but now all the old revolutionaries are dying. Now what? Well, speak well, for yourself, <laughs> Doug. <laughs> well, Doug, it's time for another question. The United States and the Soviet Union are preparing to send a man to Mars, as in the 1960s, it's another race between the two superpowers to be the first to shuttle a man. Both are working for the same goal of advancing scientific knowledge, but they are not working together. Is there a chance the U.S. and the Soviet Union could ever work together? And if so, would it be successful? Well, there's a chance the United States and the Soviet Union could work together as soon as the Soviet Union ab abandons its opposition to human dignity, human rights, and its totalitarianism. You can't say that they're both, we're both dedicated to science in the abstract. The Soviets want to put science to work for their purposes, we want to put science to work for ours. Our purposes are different, our worldviews are different, and until that worldview difference is overcome, there's no sense trying to work together. You believe the same was true during World War II? Yes, I, th I think that but Stalin... We shouldn't have thrown in with the, the Soviet Union. Well, first, there, there's a difference between co-belligerents and allies. I don't think we should have told Stalin that he couldn't fight Hitler. I think we should have applauded and said, well, I'm glad that Hitler... Uh, made this dumb move of attacking Stalin, but we should never forget that Stalin was a worse murderer than Hitler was. Okay. And to have... That's and, not the point. Well, no, the, the, the point is not whether you further that military activity that will uh, harass Hitler. The point is, for example, after the war, when we have representatives of the Stalinist government sitting in judgment on the fascists at Nuremberg, that is hypocrisy with, a capital, is. with a capital H. But the, the question isn't whether uh, we uh, can get the Soviet Union to one day get down on its knees to a statue of Thomas Jefferson. The question uh, is whether we can uh, adopt some co-belligerence against ignorance, some co-belligerence uh, uh, against disease. So you're, uh, so you're equating fighting Hitler with going to Mars? I'm saying or? these are pretty... Uh, uh, I'm some co-belligerence uh, uh, against ignorance would include uh, developing, the, uh, advancing the frontiers of science uh, at a, a lesser expense to both of when us. When we fought the Nazis with the British, we and the British were fighting out of a, out of a common ground. My the, point is, we Soviets were expedient have, we have, once, why can't we be expedient again? We have no common, well, because... We, we threw are, in with the devil once, our chief, why can't we throw in with a lesser devil today? Because at that time, when, when Russia was fighting Germany, there was another devil on the scene. Now, the principle, to quote Ronald Reagan in uh, his, some of his stronger days, the Soviet Union is the focus of evil in the world today. It is a monstrous totalitarian regime. And nothing, you, can, you can't sugarcoat it with ballet, you can't sugarcoat it with cultural exchanges, and you can't sugarcoat it with scientific information. Can you sugarcoat it with Brezhnev? With Brezhnev? Uh, Gorbachev, mean, Gor I beg your pardon. Gorbachev, uh, as Alexander Haig said in the recent debate, with Gorbachev we're dealing with one of the smoothest Soviet operators since Lenin. As Doug Wilson said less than a year ago, uh, uh, the one thing you wonder about is he is uh, so open in such a change, you wonder if he won't be overthrown. Well, that's, We've changed our mind, uh, I see. No, no, I'll put it this way. If, if he stays, he's smooth as smooth or smoother than Lenin. If he really is up to something, if he's really trying to change the Soviet system, uh, we won't see him too much longer. Yeah, I think he's trying to change the Soviet system uh, because their folks are starting to like color television sets. He's a politician and he knows that. And when I see Ronald Reagan stand outside uh, the Berlin Wall and call upon uh, uh, Gorbachev to tear it down, I wonder if the fool doesn't realize he is tearing it down from the inside if you just give him a little slack. Here's our next question, Bill. Scientists argue that they cannot work fast enough to find cures for certain diseases because the FDA holds them back. Is the Federal Drug Administration too conservative? Uh, only a bit. Uh, I think there's a lot of sense to conservatives in this area. You, you uh, run out some drug uh, before you know all the side effects, and you're going to hurt more people than you help. But there are exceptions, and certainly uh, a disease that is 100% fatal, such as AIDS, is, is one of those ex exceptions. Uh, to hell with the side effects. I would try let, almost anything. Let me ask you a question then. Do you think before something is marketed, publicly marketed, for the treatment or prevention of a certain disease, it ought to be thoroughly researched? Yes. Including condoms? Uh, condoms have already been researched oh. and found to be imperfect. Uh, uh, no, and they, what, uh, what is their efficacy in stopping a virus? 
Uh, no one knows for certain. Well, in other words, it hasn't been researched. And here we're, well, putting, no, and we're, and we're putting machines on college's campus. No, no. That, one, uh, the question isn't whether it's effective. The question, uh, everyone knows it has some effect. The question is how much effect, whether it's 20% right. or 70%. Right, which is like uh, saying if, if someone's playing Russian roulette, now you only have three bullets in the revolver instead of four. Uh, is, is that what your odds are? You don't know what the odds are, and yet you're telling a whole generation of college students that I'll, I'll uh, be willing to bet you some good money on this one, that if you ask the average man in the street what his impression is of what condoms will do for the prevention of AIDS, he will think that the efficacy is much greater than has been established by scientific research, and the only reason they are being touted as a preventative for AIDS is because some people want to keep the sexual revolution alive and they can't. It's dying. Well, I don't know what others are saying. I, I can only tell you what I say to young uh, people in this matter, and that's don't trust those things entirely. Uh, well, how don't, do you, don't, don't ha I say, how do you trust them partially? For I said, well, no, listen, listen to me. I said, uh, don't have, uh, have, uh, don't have sex with somebody you don't know. Don't ha have uh, sex with somebody who has a lot of other sexual partners. But if you're going to ignore my vice, uh, advice, then use a condom to increase your odds a little bit. But you're still playing Russian roulette. Okay, and what, and, but what is the pr impression being created out there by the marketing of condoms? What is the impression? And is that consistent with what you just said well, about the Well, all I FD, know is this show that I'm on now is only the third one I've heard this week and where they, uh, the point has been made that, that we are making now and that that's the, these things, if anyone thinks these things are 100% effective, then you better think yeah, again. But, yeah, but let's say everybody grants that they're not 100% effective. What, percent, uh, what percentage of effectiveness do we have? 97% or 3%? No. We don't know and they're being that's marketed anyway. The, the, Why I isn't heard, the FDA on, in on this one? I, I heard just, uh, and read some things within the week that, that make me believe it's 70% or less, maybe as low as 20%. Okay, but, but that's exactly the point. We don't know. And why is it being marketed when we don't know? We do know it is better than nothing. You think it's medical? So, so do, you, do you apply that better than nothing standard to uh, the other drugs that the FDA is testing? Better than nothing? Is that all you have to come up with? Is well, better there than are, nothing? Uh, there are some alternatives to some of these other things. If you talk about uh, uh, blood, high blood pressure medicine, there are dozens of drugs, some better than others, and there will be some better down the line. Uh, and some of them are now being researched will not pan out. Now, and it's before we, we don't want to find out the hard way that they don't so pan what out. Is, so what is the standard? Is the standard better than nothing? Or is it, well, uh, the standard is far different when you're dealing with a 100% fatal disease. You, you take a few more yeah, risks, well, a lot I think, more I risks than that. Welcome to Counterpoint for Thursday, December 10th. This is the program that brings together a couple of people you know. Bill Hall, the editorial page editor for the Lewiston Morning Tribune, who generally represents the liberal point of view. And on the conservative side, Doug Wilson, a Moscow minister who also writes for the Lewiston Morning Tribune. And I'm Glenn Johnson. In a few minutes, we'll go to the grab bag of current topics. But first, here's a commentary from Bill Hall. I have a question this gentle season for all those modern Scrooges out there who are so unmoved by their own ghosts of Christmas that they pay no more than the minimum wage. How little should we be permitted to pay employees who work at least as hard as we do? The minimum wage today is $3.35 an hour. That works out to about $6,500 a year. And not for so-called deadbeats on relief, but for people who go to work each day the same as everyone else. Granted, the free market is a powerful mechanism that is generally better at making jobs and good livings for all of us when it is left to function on its own. But there are limits and there are exceptions. The question isn't total regulation of the marketplace or none. The question is how little regulation can we impose without paving the way for plunder. For instance, we do regulate the cocaine and the crack market. We do require a medical merchant to present a degree before hacking us open on the operating table. We do make it against the law for a boss to require a woman who wants to keep her job to come across on the casting couch. And we do have the minimum wage. The law against an employer is getting too carried away when it comes to eating one's bread in the sweat of another man's face. If unemployment and other market forces make it possible for an employer to pay 25 cents an hour, should society mind its own business? Should society establish a minimum wage for two reasons? Because one, society will have to pick up the financial slack of an employee who has paid something below minimal existence, and two, because society has as much right to outlaw the abuse of employees as it does the beating of wives and the abuse of children. Some people, without police intervention, will abuse their families, and some will take financial liberties with their employees. Both practices should be outlawed. And anyone in this day and age, in this costly country, who isn't already paying his help more than $6,500 a year, is abusing his employees. 
especially in the light of this season. The minimum wage was invented because we learned that we could not depend on the multiple ghosts of Christmas to save hardworking people from all the wicked Scrooges. And that is surely why Tiny Tim himself once cried, God bless us everyone, especially those kindly Christmas souls who created the minimum wage laws. Ebenezer? Bill, your commentary reminds me of the fellow who wrote his congressman and asked his congressman, could they please uh, repeal the law of supply and demand? Uh, there is a general delusion that operates on the left that indicates that we can somehow, uh, by fiat, raise the, the market wage or the market price of anything, including labor. You cannot do it. If you set it in concrete, if you raise the minimum wage, what you're going to do at the same time is raise unemployment. You cannot tamper with the market, uh, with the market price for labor. You can pretend that you have done so, but you can't fix it. All you're going to do is do what liberals in this country have successfully done in the inner city, which is raise the minimum wage and drive black teenagers out of, uh, drive them out of work. Do you really want to do that? Well, first of all, we have uh, been avoiding what you're talking about for, for a good long time now. How, uh, uh, wait, wait, wait a minute. What's, what's the... We, un, have, we have had for what's years... What's the unemployment rate in the inner city for black teenagers? The unemployment rate in the inner cities for black teenagers is about 25% now. Uh, the question is what the, the rate would be uh, if, uh, if, we, if uh, we did or didn't have the minimum wage law. That's kind of... Are, a, are you saying, a there's, are there you are, saying I, there's no I'm connection? I'm saying that there aren't... Uh, I'm saying there is a connection, but there is a limit uh, to what we can stand. Can we, can we stand 25 cents an hour? Should we let employers pay 25 cents an hour? Is that, we just say that's what the market will we support. Should we should have no minimum wage laws at all. Well, then we should subsidize wages because a person should not work as hard as I do and not be able to feed his family. There's something wrong about that. Do you think it's the role of government to uh, guarantee everybody a wage? Yes, I think uh, that if the government doesn't do it, no one else will do it. I think everyone who works in this country should be paid a living wage one way or another, oh, with I, the government's help. No, no, it, you know, we're not, no, not going to do your volunteer, oh, my family will look after no, me, because a lot of families won't look after you, and you know that. No, we're... we're uh, talking about two different things. We won't address that right now. What I want to point out is